May I speak in the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Today we've just heard about not just one miracle that Jesus performed, but two. We are in for a treat, learning about how God in Jesus wants us to live in abundance. Chapter 6 in John's Gospel is a long one, and we're just looking at the first part this morning. The time of the Passover festival is approaching. Twelve months previously, just prior to the first Passover of Jesus' public ministry, Jesus had performed the miracle at Cana in Galilee. Maybe only a few people at the wedding knew that Jesus had turned water into wine, but since that time, news had spread fast about how Jesus could cure the sick. He was now drawing large crowds, despite being constantly on the move and even climbing up a mountain away from any town. Let us use our imaginations for a bit. If you were one member of the crowd that followed Jesus at that time, why are you so attracted to Jesus? How did you get to hear about him? What drove you to come after Jesus without thinking about food for the day? What are you seeking? Healing? Excitement? Entertainment? Being part of a large gathering? Or maybe to satisfy your curiosity? Were you just following the crowd? Or were you genuinely seeking for truth? Were you a true follower of Jesus? Or were you there for what you could get? Not everyone in the crowd would have been driven by the same motives. Although most of them were folk who lived simply and had basic needs. Tired and weary, Jesus and his disciples now had a crowd management problem to deal with. The towns, shops and markets were far away and they didn't have the monetary resources to buy bread anyway. Jesus would have known what he had planned to do, but still he asked Philip where they would buy bread. Philip didn't fare very well with this little test. He was too focused on the problem and the seeming impossibility of solving it for him to look to Jesus for the answer. Now we too at times can be so bound up with the impossible logic of our problems that we fail to look to Jesus and trust him to handle them. Andrew didn't fare much better, although he knew they would have to start with what they had. The five barley loaves and two little fish didn't seem a very useful offering when there were 5,000 men to feed. The women and children would have been extra. But Jesus can start with the little that is offered and multiply it until it becomes an abundance. The boy was willing to share his picnic and Jesus made it into an over-catered feast, more than anyone needed. 
The boy gave what he had, and Jesus chose to work through a person and the seeds of their faith. So this big rally became the scene of a miracle that surpassed even what Elisha had managed when he fed a hundred men. The man from Baal Shalasha had brought Elisha food from the first fruits of his barley crop, the best of what he had. So often we give our leftovers to God and think that's good enough when Jesus wants the best of what we have. God can multiply what we give him, but he can't work with what we hold back. Although Jesus had attracted a huge crowd, maybe 6% of the population around Galilee at that time he was not seeking attention or adulation. And this is unlike a lot of today's political rallies where the speaker makes themselves to be the centre of attention. Jesus wanted his followers to understand a lot more yet. And he certainly wasn't keen to be put on a kingly pedestal. Providing bread for the people gave him the opportunity to teach about the bread of life. At the third Passover festival of his ministry, he would institute the Lord's Supper. The bread was to be his body, broken for us. And the wine compare back to the miracle at Cana, would be his blood shed for us as a mark of the new covenant. After the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus withdrew to the mountain to be by himself, away from the people with their own agenda. Tired after a long day, the disciples set off in a boat without him rowing as best they could to get to Capernaum. It was difficult rowing against the prevailing wind. Not surprisingly, they were frightened when they saw Jesus walking on the water towards them. This was not natural. It was a miracle. However, when they invited Jesus to join them in the boat, their path to the shore became clear and direct. Well, how do we respond to these miraculous events in Jesus' ministry? In our culture, we often overthink stuff. We want to sort out our own problems to be self-reliant and strong. In our developed consumer society, have we lost the ability to have a simple trust in the one from whom all our blessings flow? Paul prayed for the Christians in Ephesus that Christ would dwell in their hearts through faith as they became rooted and grounded in Jesus' love. Our trust in God stems from the sure knowledge that Jesus loves us. Our minds cannot fully comprehend God's love and power because it is beyond our human understanding. But God can do far more than we all we ask or imagine when we give what we have to him. What can you give him? Give him the best, your first fruits.
of your time, of your money, and your talents. Don't insult God with your leftovers. In simple faith, let Jesus provide for your needs. Invite him to be with you in the squally winds of life, to steer a direct path to the other side of each difficulty. Let us not be one of life's takers, always looking for what we can get. We are called to follow Christ, to give him all that we are and all that we have.